And good morning and welcome to Where's the Money, which is brought to you by the Independent Film and Television Alliance and presented by Wrapbook Payroll. And my name is Robin Burt, the Vice President of Marketing and Membership for the Independent Film and Television Alliance and the American film market that I'm excited to say is taking place in Las Vegas this year, November 5 through 10 at the Palms Casino Resort Hotel. And we hope all of you will be joining us in Vegas this year. Today's webinar is part of a three-part series focused on the realities of film financing today. And before we get started, I'd like to share a short video from our friends at Ratbook, the production industry's only on-demand payroll and accounting platform, helping film productions to pay their crews with a click, generate reports on demand, and manage production accounting in real time. Here's the video. And before I um, introduce the moderator, uh, we will be taking questions from the audience. Click on the uh, Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Patrick uh, Rizzotti, who is the president for Blue Fox Financing. Patrick has successfully secured over $100 million in financing more than 20 plus feature films. He runs the first of its kind film and television debt and gap digital marketplace a transactional digital platform to streamline and expedite film financing opportunities for the entertainment industry connecting borrowers with the largest database of film and television lenders and gap financiers and it's my pleasure to hand it over to patrick thank you robin i appreciate it as always um and thank you jennifer and bill and 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 for ifta for putting this uh event up and all the events that you guys do um, they're all fantastic and extremely informative and very fun to be involved in. I also want to mention I'm extremely excited about Las Vegas this year, by the way, as a side note. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I know a lot of other producing um, relationships are excited about the, the new um, city that we're going to next year or this year. Um, so as Robin touched on, I've been producing for around 20 years and every time I get financing in place for a film. I feel like I want to drop to a knee and pray. Um, I know all of us on this panel know how difficult it is to secure financing. Uh, today, however, we're diving into how these producers are getting films made in today's landscape. We'll also touch on critical areas like film development, uh, packaging, uh, basic financing models, maximizing tax credits, and the importance of having a great foundation, including a solid payroll and accounting team in place in advance of any uh, production money being spent. Um, as Robin pointed out, I run a film and television marketplace for debt and gap financing called Blue Fox Financing. Our model is unique, which allows us to work with many of the financiers, uh, including banks, private lending institutions, and individual investors. Because of this, we get to see a lot of different deal flow that comes through. Uh, and there's clear to me that there are certain groups of producers who are constantly getting movies made and organizations that know how to spearhead logistics when a film is gearing up for pre-production. So this leads me to our awesome panelists today. Thank you guys for, for um, all jumping on. Appreciate it. Uh, we have an incredible group here who are not just making movies. They're managing to do it with budgets that are well beyond the average for independent films. Um, I'm going to be asking these guys the question, the tough questions to decide, uh, you know, and figure out how to uncover their secret sauce and how are they doing it? What logistical steps and development give them the best shot of success? Um, hopefully you'll, you'll give us a sneak, a peek under your guys's hood 
and give us some insights for all the producers listening in. Um, and also would love to touch on your backgrounds from a, from a development standpoint and a production standpoint. So with that, um, I'm gonna jump into our first panelist, Jeremy Ross. Jeremy is a film producer, film finance executive. He has clo uh, closed over $150 million in film financing for uh, independent films, including his last $20 million animated movie starring, uh, called Sneak, starring Anthony Mackie and Lawrence Fishburne. Um, he's also working with a massive shoe brand uh, partner on that film, which we're going to get a little bit more into the IP development uh, a little bit later in my questions. Uh, he's now closing financing on a $75 million budget animated movie based on an iconic 1980s gaming IP. Uh, and, and that is a true independent film on how he structured that. Um, it's a, the press release is going to be coming out shortly and everyone on the planet will know this IP. Um, Jeremy's an expert in film financing structures. And because of that, producers hire him to figure out the best way to structure their debt and gap, gap financing. And I work with him every day in Blue Fox Financing, and he's totally invaluable to us. Um, next up, we have Marcus Englefield. Marcus is the co-founder and partner at Stereoscopic Films, so 25 years of experience in the entertainment industry. Um, he was formerly president of Venture 3D, where he worked on projects like Green Hornet, Titanic, and Priest back in the day. And his clients range from Warner Brothers, Sony, Lionsgate, et cetera. 2016, Marcus partnered with director Michael Bay to create 541 Media Group, focusing on graphic novel IP, uh, which we're gonna get into that a little bit more um, uh, as well. He then transitioned from visual effects to producing animated movies like Animal uh, Crackers and No Malone, um, which also to Netflix. He then moved, uh, progressed into live action and horror films. Uh, currently, he's in post production on Tiger Mom with Ken Jong and Vi Vampires of the Velvet Lounge, which was a twenty million dollar independent film. Which, as an interesting side fact, was the largest um, budgeted indie film shooting in the United States during the strike. Um, next up, Jamie Thompson. Jamie R. Thompson. Jamie's um, prolific career in the film industry included producing over 35 movies, which have um, featured many prolific actors like Nick Cage, Aaron Eckhart, Tommy Lee Jones, uh, James Franco, Terrence Howard, and many, many, many more. After becoming a producer, Jamie held leadership uh, positions in several sales agencies, notably he served as a VP of sales at Movie Bank and later went on to become the president of various sales agencies, including Quantum, Camelot, and his current role at Lighthouse. We're going to get into the sales side, Jamie, a bit more on your background and how you use that background into your um, you know, producing side today and development. Jamie always has a movie in production. I, I, every time we talk to him, he's either in prep or production and post. And sometimes these films are crossing over. So I'm I'm ex excited to talk to you, Jamie, and and get a better understanding of how in the heck you're able to get so many movies into production the last couple of years. Uh, and then last but not least, we have Ryan uh, Bouchard. Uh, Ryan is the Rap Books VP of Sales and Production Incentives. He has worked with productions of all sizes, from the largest studio features to the smallest independent films. Um, one of his many talents is helping producers optimize their production incentive strategies and making the most of their budgets. I can say firsthand how incredibly important it is to know where the best tax incentives are coming from and to make sure that you have the local crew that's going to support that. We're going to touch a bit more on that with Ryan um, in, in some of these questions. Ryan's career um, in production payroll began 16 years ago, and he worked for companies like Entertainment Partners, Caps and served as a tax incentive manager in media service at Media Services, um, where he was the VP of Sales and Production Incentives. Um, he is a expert when it comes to uh, tax incentives, and I can't wait to dive in with you, Ryan, and get your take on where in where, what states are the best incentives now. Um, just really, you know, what are the pitfalls? What do they try to avoid? Um, so with that said, I'm going to jump back in to start peppering you guys with questions and, and everyone feel free to chime in if you have some insight you want to share. Marcus, if you don't mind, uh, maybe share a bit more about your background and how you got into producing from the visual effects side. And, you know, maybe talk a little bit about uh, what 
what it was like making your first movie. Um, you know, what that process was like making your first film from visual effects into producing. Sure. Um, it's kind of, uh, I think everyone comes into film differently. It's, it's, it's you know, it's sort of a, the talked about thing amongst everyone in the industry. It's like th there is no right or wrong way to get in. Right. It's like you, you, you just find your entry point and you can literally be, you know, getting coffees. You can do it from the legal side, from the business side, um, you know, or obviously from from a, uh, you know, a craft side and, and services side. So for me, um, my entry point was um, the visual effects side. Uh, we had a 3D conversion company. Um, we sort of parlayed 3D conversion into animation because that's a, a, an easy jump. Um, and then from, you know, animation, we, uh, we moved into live action. Um, you know, I think, um, as far as how and why people come into the industry, it's kind of, I think, you know, the passion's got to be there. I think, you know, first movie, um, I think you're going to make every mistake in the book. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's super scary because obviously, you know, it doesn't matter if you're doing a million dollar horror to, you know, a 25, $30 million animation and above, um, it gets super scary because, uh, you know, you need a bunch of good people who understand what they're doing. Um, you, you, you know, you, it's hit and miss. Um, and, and that harks back to what you were saying about good crews and, you know, mitigating risk and that's, you know, the tax incentives and, and everything else. But ultimately it comes down to, uh, you know, passion, which is if, if, if you want to get up every day and that's all you want to do and problem solve, you're going to be okay. And for all the other producers out there, it's like, you know, I, I think a lot of businesses it's based on, you know, acumen and know-how and everything else. Film is um, as much, if not more than any other industry, you better be really good at problem solving. Uh, you better enjoy problem solving because um, it's going to be a constant battle, <laughs> but it's rewarding. Totally. And, and Jeremy, if you don't mind, you know, I know you have a business background and, um, I'm I'm just curious if you can maybe expand a bit on what made you kind of segue into wanting to produce a movie from the business side and, and maybe just give some insight on what it was like getting your first movie made as a producer. Sure. Yeah. So I, I'm someone who, uh, you know, am, am very sort of, you know, business minded and, and transactional in nature. Uh, two times in my life, I've you know, gotten this close to becoming a banker um, out of um, out of undergrad, and then and then later out of out of business school. And I didn't do it because I just love movies. I had no affinity to the product um, in in helping people raise money in in, in other industries. Um, and I and I really thought that you know, in a business that's largely controlled, um, you know, by uh, by really big creative personalities, that there'd always be an opportunity. Um, for someone who can kind of do the dirt, dirty work, you know, the, the business and legal affairs type stuff. Um, <clears throat> I started with um, the producer, John Williams, uh, who had made the Shrek franchise. And off of that, he raised a lot of money. And we did, at the time, there was only maybe three places in the world where you could do a proper CG animated film. And we did some really innovative things um, during the, doing kind of the first true indies. Um, we did a movie for... Disney, we did a movie for Fox, then one for Lionsgate. And it was like, you know, the split rights model that we all do now for $40 million animated movie. So it's pretty unique at the time. I was watching it. I was a young guy. I wasn't really doing it. Um, I got my first crack at a movie. It was, it was the sequel to the movie that we did for Fox. And what we were told by Fox was the movie performed well enough to do a sequel, but not well enough to do it for a big budget. So it was a three and a half million dollar animated film which is like you know for the for the live action guys on this on this uh is on par with doing a live action movie for like four hundred dollars um it, you know it was really, really tough we, we had money for um, like almost no personnel and so as someone who um sort of knew enough to be dangerous in a lot of things i had to handle a hundred percent of the accounting uh legal casting um, we said we hired one vendor in india to do the cg animated work um, and it was the you know best learning experience I ever had. Um, I don't really want to make more movies like that, but you know it gives me an angle going forward on films where I kind of know enough to be dangerous with uh, with everything. And then a few years later, Marcus dragged me into the live action world with uh, with with a live action film that 
you know, he sort of had most of the money and it was like, let's team up and get the rest of it. Um, and then at some point, Patrick, that, that led me to you and, and Blue Fox. Cool. I appreciate it. Um, Jamie, I, I'd love to get your perspective on what the transition was like. You know, you were working in the sales side uh, and, and you still are in the sales side, I, I think now for your own films. But what was that transition like from going from sales to saying, all right, I'm, I know how to sell a movie. Now I'm going to go produce. Yeah. Um, basically, I uh, I started doing a, a international sales in around 2003. And um, and after being in that side of the business for about 10 years, I started realizing that I was either going to be working with an acquisitions based model and purely acquiring other people's films after they were completed, which at that point, typically you're not uh, getting as commercial films uh, sometimes or, or, or films with uh, bigger names or bigger budgets. And, th and that was just kind of what led me to that transition. And um, it all started with just um, a meeting I'd had in Cannes where uh, a, a major uh, a major distributor, actually, one of the studios, uh, they, I, I was having a meeting with one of their reps, and they said that uh, they'd really liked me, but I needed to actually show them that I could produce a movie instead of just uh, sell a movie. And if I could do that, then they'd start doing business with me. So I immediately uh, started developing uh, a very low budget, um, low budget uh, feature that, uh, you know, I think we shot it for less than a half a million dollars just to learn how to produce. And then like uh, Marcus had said and, uh, and others, I mean, you know, I hit every branch falling down the tree. So, <laughs> and that's just kind of how I, uh, how I started on. Uh, how I started understanding how producing worked. Um, but the, the, tr the transition really started with just uh, realizing, you know, coming from a sales background, understanding what the marketplace wants and what the distributors were looking for, and then using that to start developing projects or getting involved with projects that worked within that, you know, that marketplace. Cool. Uh, Ryan, I, I know your perspective is is unique um, given your your background and what you're currently doing. Um, if you don't mind, can you share some context on how important um, payroll is uh, at an earlier stage in in either either development or pre-production? Because I think even for me, you know, it took me many, many movies for me to even be thinking about payroll and accounting until the last possible second because it was just being punted uh, down the line. And I, I I know how now I know how incredibly invaluable it is on on many fronts, and I just still love to get your perspective on that for you know a producer who's in development thinking they don't need to be thinking about this stuff. Yeah, yeah, it is a totally different perspective um, than than the other people on this call, and I've worked with people like on this call and with people on this call, so it's amazing to see their faces and see their names, and I've always kind of seen it as a partnership when working with them. When I did come into the industry, I knew nothing other than like Jeremy, I loved movies and wanted to somehow get into it. And I came in at an entry level position and I just happened to be in the right place at the right time where I was in New Orleans and that was, you know, Louisiana was one of, if not the first incentive along with Georgia and New Mexico to pop off in, in the US. And a lot of independent producers uh, were trying to navigate that and figure that out. And I, it turned out I just kind of had a knack for absorbing it and then breaking it down into layman's terms. I think one of the things that people forget about, and we've alluded to it, everybody that spoke has kind of alluded to it already, is the fact that it's show business. And that, you know, the business side of this amazing industry is just one that gets overlooked, ironically enough. People are just so focused sometimes on their amazing script and who they have attached that they forget about the ins and outs of the money, keeping things in play. And I just started to realize that with working for payroll companies, production payroll companies, how important these incentives were, that they were a detriment, you know, if they weren't being used for these independents. And that if you're accounting, your payroll wasn't all intact. You know, you said it, Patrick, like, oh, maybe payroll was like an afterthought or something you thought of later on in your career. But if people don't get paid, they're not showing up. And if they get paid incorrectly, especially with all the union stuff that happened and that's is happening, um, there's going to be uh, hell to pay. So we just want to make sure everybody's getting paid correctly and on time. And, you know, the payroll, it's the least sexiest side of the sexiest business, <laughs> but it's the most important because you want your crews to show up and you want them to be happy 
and uh, your accounting needs to be in order for people like Jeremy and yourself that are financing films and making sure, hey, are all my are all the T's crossed and all the I's dotted? So it became such a backbone of productions, especially independents, to make sure the accounting, the payroll, and the incentive was all buttoned up. So really something I've seen firsthand and love to help people navigate, but um, it's a huge factor when, uh, especially for independents, when trying to get things made. Cool. Uh, Marcus, um, can maybe talk a little bit, if you don't mind, on the progression of making your first movie versus making your last one um, and, and how your approach into producing a movie may have uh, hopefully evolved. Um, and, you know, what are the things that you look at now when you go into development or excuse me, in a pre-production on a film and even and even maybe discuss a bit on going to try to secure financing today versus when you first started? Sure. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously for I think all of us on this and, and everyone sort of listening in, um, you know, financing a movie is, is you know, <laughs> incredibly difficult. I, I don't want to sugarcoat that. <laughs> Um, and for every one we develop, um, you know, we, we probably have a success of one in five. I uh, like and, and And even that, I think, is outrageously high. Um, so but I, I mean, it's probably easiest rather than jump. I think from from how I started to how how the last one went, I, I think it's just, you know, it sort of goes into two buckets for people who are just starting out trying to finance a film, trying to make a film, um, you know, and, and reading through some of the, the, the questions that are, that are on the, the comments. Um, you know, the first thing is to, to obviously start with good IP, something, you know, that, 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 that you like, that appeals. And, and, you know, I, it can be, you know, if it's a horror, it's got to be scary and of jump scares and, and all that and compelling characters. And, and that's, that goes across all, all, all genres. It's got to be well-written. You've got to start with something good. It doesn't mean you end with something good, but it sure as hell isn't going to end good if it starts with something bad. I can promise you that. So I think, you know, for, for us, it's, it's about, um, you know, when we when we start raising the financing, um, the the first thing is we look at what is the value of the package, right? And and so that that harks back to what um, you know Jamie was saying, and and you know we we have multiple sales agents we use. We don't even use the same companies for for all our films. We we jump around, and certain companies are better at romantic comedies and horrors, and horrors to action. And you know um, you know you're you're trying to find someone um, who you trust with a relationship. So for first time guys. You know, it's it's at places like AFM where you're going to meet sales agents and, you know, with your projects. And, and you know, it's about getting numbers from them saying, hey, I've got this person, this person in this genre with this director. This is my budget. And they'll say, well, this is the value of the package. Now, you can then change the package, you know, while well, this guy didn't work, but this guy's up and coming and, and or has great value here. That can help. Um, you can look at it as... Um, you know, you, you can bring down the budget or you can move locations. And so, so if I give like a very real world example, you know, we had um, a movie that uh, we'd set up the sale, uh, you know, 1.8 on, on a horror film with, uh, you know, two lead actors attached um, over the course of six months of us setting it up and locking in all the financing the market changed as we all know it's not a great time right now and it's you know stay alive till 25 is is the motto right now um but but how we did it it started in vancouver i couldn't make it work in vancouver at basically 1.3 to support 1.8 so we moved it to kentucky i got it down to a million that still didn't work i had to move to the dominican republic so it's now 850 with 150 as a tax credit net 700 now i can make that movie but that that i had to move like like four times, well, three times. Um, and, you know, it's super stressful. Um, I'm scouting each time at different locations. I'm lucky we we have a crew in Vancouver. We have a crew in Dominican Republic. Um, but, you know, we had to find one in Kentucky and you're calling around friends and who's good and meeting with the film commission who was a great resource at all of these, you know, tax uh, efficient jurisdictions. Um, but that's what it takes. It's, you know, getting on planes, getting on calls. It's it's being able to pivot. And as an indie filmmaker, that's what that's what you have to do, um, you know, and, and hopefully that that gives some I, I know that's on, on the more basic side. So if there are seasoned people listening, you know, there there's, you know, 181. There's a whole bunch of other stuff we can get into later. But yeah, that's well, yeah, the well, yeah. basic premise, you know. 
I, I would say, which is, you know, look at the tax, you know, see what the value of the package is, because if the market tells you it's not worth that, you can't look at your investor or the banks and then be like, hey, I'd like to make it for this. They're like, it's not worth that. And the market will tell you. Um, and, and your conduit to the market is the sales agent. Yeah, and, and it's always the chicken and the egg that 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 we all deal with. And Jamie, I'd love to get your perspective on this because, you know, on on one hand, you need to have the package in order to go get the pre sales, which you seem to do on on all of your movies because of your background. You have the ability to to go get those pre sales, but you know, a lot of producers are out there of like, how do I create the package? How do I get the talent? How do I get the right director? If I don't have the, if I need that to get the pre-sale, then it's going to go get the financing. So, you know, what, what is there any insight that you can share on your, you know, how do you go get an Aaron Eckhart uh, attached to your film that then would allow you to go get a pre-sale? Um, yeah, I love, I love to get your insight on that. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it, uh, just kind of bouncing back to the basics of the whole thing is, is just. Uh, it, it, establishing really strong relationships with the right people. And I mean, that all takes time, but that's it's as basic of an answer as that is. It's the truth. Uh, and, and, uh, and that's why, sorry to, 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 uh, harken back to events like AFM and can in Berlin and, uh, and these type of, uh, um, film markets are, are, are really essential, um, not just for the, the, the buyers and the sales agents, but also for the producers to go to, um, it, because it's it's really creating that network of being able to understand if I have Aaron Eckhart in my movie, what is the value of that movie in the foreign territories or or in the domestic market, and uh, um, and that's not common knowledge. That's not something that just a, a person off the street's going to be able to understand and know. They're going to need a sales agent, or they're go going to need somebody who uh, who who has access to that type of information. And and so typically, you know, for me, I mean, just obviously having having time spent in the industry and understanding the values of of actors, genres, projects, uh, you know, and and uh, so on. Um, typically, for me, I'm kind of uh, I'm working backwards and I'm advancing the ball, you know, uh, in, in small increments as we go along, and saying like, okay, I I know if I'm making an I'm making X action movie, it has a male lead. That that's in his 40s or 50s, that there's this list of these actors are going to be able to get me this amount of money. These actors are going to get me a, a, a different tier of, of, of money on the pre-sale market. And then typically, you're not necessarily making the offers to those actors immediately. You're starting out by kind of going out into the marketplace, identifying, you know, if I had X actor, you know, who who's willing to buy it? And then uh, when when those buyers are kind of identified and you feel like you've kind of hedged the bet enough to be able to make the offer to the actor, then I make the offer to the actor and say, OK, well, you know, we'll give you X amount of dollars for, you know, however many days on this film. And um, because I know that I'm able to back that offer against uh, against distribution with, uh, uh, you know, with with the sales essentially identified, not necessarily closed. Um, and that's that's partially how I kind of work with uh uh, you know, with attaching the names that kind of mean something. But again, it all comes back to, you know, attending these markets. And and one thing I do want to preface is, as a producer, when you attend these markets, the buyers are there to buy, the sellers are there to sell. They're not really, they're not going to want to hear your pitch necessarily there. Your best bet is to mingle, meet people socially, make friends, and then talk to them after the market. Because you're likely not going to be able to just walk into somebody's booth and say I have an idea for a movie, and they're and they're probably going to say I'm trying to sell other movies. Come back later. So uh, that's one big. I suggestion. just want to piggyback one one question with that, Jamie. The the you know you obviously there's there's typically a combination of tax credit, a third of your budget, maybe less. Mm -hmm. You know pre sales and then equity. Um, when you typically go out, and I open this up to everyone too. When are you having your equity conversation? with that potential investor and are you pitching them saying, Hey, listen, all I need is a third and I'm going to go back into everything else. Um, or, or do you try to do the actual pre-sale and, 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 and get your head around the tax credit and then go talk to the equity side? Uh, yeah. I'm just curious what your process is like. I, I would say it's everything and all and both. And <laughs> I mean, it's, it's however <laughs> you can make it all fit together. I mean, I, I'm typically, you know, 
I'm coming up with the value of the film, uh, fi figuring out where I'm going to shoot it to have the best, best best tax credit. I mean, you're really putting together a multi-layered puzzle. Uh, you, you know that you're going to need, uh, you know, a debt financing against your tax credits and your pre-sales. You're going to need potentially some, uh, you know, gap financing to cover the shortfalls. You're going to be uh, looking for, uh, you know, bridge loans to get you into production. Um, and there's just there's so, so many different layers to how you're putting it all together. And, and usually, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for equity as I'm starting. I'm looking for equity as I'm, I'm um, finishing the finance package. I'm looking for equity sometimes while I'm shooting the movie, um, you know, and uh, and I mean, I think you're always uh, in this kind of like, a, you know, a mode of, of looking for looking for uh, how are you going to make all of your financing pieces fit together? Um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think, you know, I think one of the key things I just I've kind of learned in my career is once a train starts moving, everybody's trying to get on, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, so the yeah, more you the can key. get the package moving forward. Uh, then it becomes more attractive to people because it's not yeah. just a coffee house conversation about a movie you want to make. It suddenly becomes yeah, yeah. If it, if it feels it's like it's going and it's got momentum, it, 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 it all of a sudden it separates itself from the rest of the pack. Yeah, um, Jeremy, I, I question for you. Um, oh, go ahead, I, Ryan. Yeah, I just have a quick comment about that. Like with for for really the whole crew, because I'm curious, Jamie, when you're talking about the the puzzle. Um, I'm more on the back end in the sense that I'm the la I'm involved more in that last piece of the puzzle with the tax incentives. That's the biggest mistake I kind of see is somebody will say, Hey, I just applied for this tax credit. And I'm like, and I got, and they say, I got approved. And I'm like, great. And then I said, what about the rest of your equity? What about the rest of your finance? And they're like, where do I start? Can you help me with that? And I'm like, Oh my gosh, you kind of did it a, a little backwards. Uh, you know, because it's usually the, the tax incentive is usually the last piece of that puzzle that you want to make sure everything else is in place. So I'm just curious from this group and Patrick, honestly, I'll, I'll switch it and you can be part of the, the panel on this one. Maybe I'd like to get your answer on this as well is where does that first dollar come from? Because I'm usually not involved with that. I'm just using telling people good luck. It's like you said, it's, it's like a miracle if these things happen. Where does that first set of equity come from that first bundle of, of money so that in the bank, those other pieces in that train is rolling. So I'm so curious because I'm usually on that last piece of like, yeah, you have 80% there. Let's go for that incentive. So I'm kind of curious more on the, on the very front side. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll jump in there. And if everyone else feel free to jump in too. I mean, and Jeremy can attest to this too, because what comes in, we see a lot of different projects come in every single day in various forms of, you know, um, no financing to 100% financed. And uh, there's a lot of projects that come to us with just tax credit. And my, my, my view is, you know, um, it actually is extremely smart to get the tax credit piece in place, even if that's all you have. Because then, when you go out, you, you're you're kind of uh, you're, you're 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 streamlining your financing plan, and so when you now approach your equity investor, you now are approaching them with a reduced risk that 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 shows to them that you're doing what it needs to be done as a producer to reduce their equity as much as possible, and so I, I would say that you also want to you know like leaning on what Marcus and and Jeremy and Jamie do all the time is, you know if, if you find you find that that you kind of back into what the equity is that you would need. You know, if you have an Aaron Eckhart um, or the equivalent uh, that, that you know that it has that value and, and it still has a 20, 20% gap. Now you kind of know what you're trying to get from an equity side um, and which we haven't even gotten in the gap. And I will ask a couple of questions on that too, but you know, I think ideally for me, it's um, you want to eliminate the gap. All the, I mean, the, the equity altogether, if at all possible. And, you really have a combination of tax credits, pre-sales, and then a gap against the worldwide estimates beyond it, yep. you know, because the, the second you start crossing into equity, unless you're making like Marcus an $850,000 independent, potentially genre movie. And in that scenario, all that goes out the window because you're making it for so little, it's got a huge upside, but minus that, I think you want to do everything you can to never say the word equity to someone personally. I guess I think um, if, if I can weigh in on this, I, I think that the only difference is that the market has shifted and I'm seeing a lot of questions in the Q&A that I think I could cover with just this this little brief statement. 
um, is that the, the market has shifted a lot in the past couple of years. Um, Marcus is right about survive till 25. I mean, I, I, I've never heard somebody say that, but it was a, it was a, such an accurate statement. Um, the, the pre-sale market has completely, uh, I, I mean, it's, shr it's shrank, it's shrank considerably. And there's a lot of factors just to answer some people's questions on that, that have caused this. It's, it's COVID. Uh, after COVID was done, there was such a, a glut of filmmaking. There were so many projects made in greenlit uh, that that there become there became too many projects available. Briefly, and even with the strikes, which we expected that the SAG strike and WGA strike was going to kind of set the reset button on that a little bit, it actually didn't because we had the perfect storm of all of the streamers started cutting their uh, their uh, their. Um, acquisitions budgets they started cutting their uh, production budgets and we're kind of we're kind of left in this place right now where the pre-sale market is uh kind of worse than it's ever been and uh without getting too much into detail about the different uh different domestic uh, distribution companies especially on the independent side of things a lot of them are uh there's several that have gone out of business over the past year and a half two years there's several that are are cutting their uh, production and acquisitions budgets tremendously on the independent side because they're not be able to then sell it to the streamers or the pay one windows is what we kind of refer to it as. So in my opinion, I mean, what I'm kind of trying to, for the first time in my career, um, most of my career has been free sales tax credits make the movie. And, and that's been my model for years. And uh, right now my models become more try to, acquire uh you know equity financing and, and and there's a lot of questions i saw in the chat about like 181 financing which is probably too complex to really get too in depth into a, a q a like this but um you know, it's finding alternative means of financing uh because the pre-sale market i think you maybe if you're lucky can count on half of your financing coming from pre-sales if you're lucky and then you're going to look at your tax credits are going to be, let's say, roughly 25% uh, of your financing. Uh, you know, it's usually somewhere in that range after after financing costs. That last 25 has to come from somewhere. And a lot of banks aren't going to loan, especially on an independent film, gap financing. Um, gap financing is a little harder to come by unless you have a reliable uh, sales agent with proven estimates. So that that equity piece has become kind of more important than ever. Um, but I, I mean, that's where when you do your research a little bit on 181 and um, uh, the, the 181 is especially because and that's specific to the United States. But there's other mechanisms in the UK and other places where uh, where your investors can have a benefit for investing that equity and reduce their tax liability a, a little bit in the process. And so that equity piece becomes just such an important part right now. And I think it also kind of puts filmmakers a little more in the driver's seat having a little bit of that equity because they're not, not relying on, especially the domestic uh, or the U.S. Uh, distributors putting up an MG and you're able to kind of go into the open market with a completed film and have a little more value out of it that way. Yeah. Um, Jeremy, I, I, a question for you just on the flip side of, because I know it's it's a little doom and gloom just because the market um, is not as, you know, fl flourishing as it, as it maybe was a couple of years ago. But on the flip side, you're you're producing a seventy five million dollar independent animated movie. That to me is still mind blowing when I hear that number. Frankly, um, can you just talk a little bit about um, your progression of like how, how are you coming into ideas and IP and development where you're you have the wherewithal to back it into a twenty million dollar budget or a thirty million dollar budget or in this case seventy five million. From an independent standpoint, you're not just walking into a studio as writing 100. percent You're not walking into Netflix. You're piecing it together, and I'd love to get your perspective of how you're able to do that. Yeah, well, I mean, just to echo some of the sentiment from you know uh, Jamie and Marcus here. I mean, you know, you just have to remember trying to make these movies. You're constantly auditioning. You know, for every you know, you're you're trying to demonstrate to invest to equity investors that you may have an, an ability to get actors or to get sales and you're trying to convince the actors and their representatives that you may have the equity you're trying to convince the people who may buy your film um that uh, that you have an ability to to make it and, and get it done and so you know my approach right now uh because because animated movies are very large for you know, a small animated movie would be 20 million dollars which is a very large indie 
um, is I have to just constantly be focused on distribution first, uh, primarily here um, in the US where um, it's really, really difficult. Uh, there's very few, you know, to recoup a $20 million budget, you need a pretty meaningful theatrical release. And there's just not a lot of those. So I spend a lot of my time nowadays trying to figure out like a real sy systemic plan uh, for, re you know, releasing, you know, movies on more than a thousand screens in the U.S. because the the, the, the international value will just not be there um, if you don't have it. And 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 I'm, I'm learning most in a hard way. And I know Marcus has been there, too, um, on a film that I'm finishing now that I haven't been able to give anyone a release date on for, for quite a long time. And it's and it's a real problem. The the. Um, so I, I I mean my very first recommendation to anyone trying to do an animated film is you know like goals one two and three is domestic distribution meaningful domestic distribution otherwise the movie's not going to get made shouldn't get made to be honest um, the seventy five million dollar film is pretty is is a is a is a result of real innovation um, in the space um, it's it's someone who is responsible for um, uh, it's an entrepreneur who is responsible for um, big studio distribution that was theatrical who realized that what people, uh, the prices that people will pay internationally for big name IP um, in, in sort of the streaming market was completely disconnected from what they'll pay for really small films. Um, so like, you know, Trolls 2, for example, like the appetite for streaming windows all over the world on that um, is almost infinite. Um, and and so this entrepreneur who was at a big studio left um, and raised some money um, and is looking for exactly these kinds of films. Um, and, and he told me this may sound really large for an indie, but like my sales estimates for uh, a $75 million premium uh, animated film, my, my international sales estimates are $135 million. If you told me the budget was 45, my estimates would be $20 million. Um, and that's just kind of the state of the marketplace and the, you know, the sort of uh, Super Mario Brothers fever that that people in animation are experiencing right now. Ryan, uh, it'd be great to get your perspective because you see so many independent films come through, um, you know, to you guys doing the payroll. I'm just curious, is there a uh, an average budget that you're seeing, whether it's increasing or decreasing post-strike? Um, where, where do those numbers, where are they typically falling? Because I, I think a lot of times producers, um, what I like to do is I kind of work my way backwards. I try to think of the least expensive version of that script, um, you know, and, and that, without affecting the creative and then kind of start, have a foundation of what's the worst case scenario for me to make it. And I, I'm just curious what you're seeing that average to be. Yeah, it's it's really interesting times right now. I I it's funny. I don't see anything in between. I'm I'm seeing like budgets that are just micro budgets, essentially. I'm I'm seeing a lot of those get made surprisingly. So definitely under a million, and then I'm seeing you know the ones that are between one and five with the independent, typical producers that I work with, and then it kind of catapults up to above, you know, to twenty. You know. Um, that's typically what I'm seeing as far as like the budgets changing. Um, you know, it's funny. It seems like the streamers, the networks and the studios are saying, Hey, your budgets need to be smaller, but with inflation going on, it's like, how are we supposed to do that? And I see a lot of people cutting things like accounting, um, and, you know, with regards to incentives and whatnot, and, you know, giving answers to someone like yourself and, and to Jeremy and, and to Marcus is that like, you need to put more money to your accounting. And they're, they're, that seems to be the first place they go to cut. They're like, oh, I just have one person in accounting. I mean, like, that's the backbone of your show. And you're, you're cutting it there to make, you know, to make a certain number that somebody's telling you, whoever's in control of that. So it's, it's very, very interesting to see um, that, you know, there's a lot of these micro ones happening and they're happening all over. We're doing a slew of them. And then, the one to five is still somewhat healthy. And then it just kind of jumps. I'm not seeing any like eights or tens. I'm not seeing a lot of those cross my desk recently. Um, and maybe that's just, just me personally, but that's, that's just kind of my perspective of what I'm seeing. Yeah. Um, um, Marcus, you know, um, 
curious on your your last movie was a 20 plus million dollar independent film um when you first started developing that project what was it originally at that level did you start off smaller um you know so answering the question on that movie and then generally speaking for you how do you dictate where the budget's going to land at least out of the gate of when you're developing something and you're trying to get financing just curious if there's a uh, model that you guys try to find internally that 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 like for example for me i want to find the absolute least expensive version of that script and then and then infuse everything on top of it i'm curious what your process is internally yeah i think it's it's a tricky one it's probably easier to say like i think films for 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 me and and i think you know for for i think a lot of season producers fall into two buckets one is um you know um i'll just call them programmers where it's it's like literally i'm looking at what is the um least expensive most tax efficient <laughs> version of that movie. So it's you're, you're normally looking at genre movies and I've a bunch of comments, you know, um, we have in the chat, which is, you know, um, if, if it's action, then 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 invariably, unless, you know, you get lucky with a film like The Raid, you're, you're looking at a named actor, which I know is difficult to go find if you're a first time producer, because obviously agents and managers, you know, they're, they're looking at a track record. Will my guy be looked after? Because no one gets fired for saying no. They definitely get fired for saying yes. And they're actor not having a good experience. Um, so, you know, <laughs> I think. For us, the the programmers are uh, the genre pieces, so it's horror, action, sci-fi, thrillers. I, I guess those that that bucket of four. I'm sure you know Jamie would say the the same. Um, you know, I think of all of them, the all of them require somewhat of a name. Except horror, you can definitely get away with less. Um, and so, if I'm starting out the gate on my first film, I would 100% do a horror. Um, you know, you can look at like Terrify, there's, you know, every every year there's one or two that, that bubble up. Um, but what you don't see is most of them, you know, it, you know, it's it's very possible to get a sale and the type of actor you need, um, you know, to put in it is really you're selling a genre. So it's like you don't really need um, a name. Obviously, it helps. Uh, Jamie and I would both tell you and then and Jeremy, too, if, if you did have somewhat of a recognizable name, I, I can tell you on. The, the last two horrors we did, uh, one had uh, um, uh, Mina Suvari, um, who's fantastic, by the way. Um, uh, the other one, we had Amanda Sante and Joey Lauren Adams. Um, we have a bunch of, you know, super good looking 18 to 25 year olds running around, you know, and, and getting, you know, butchered or whatever it is you're into. Um, that definitely helps. I mean, you, you're, you're going for an audience which is, you know, young, um, you know, it skews both male and female. It, it, you know, you can get, you know, a, a pretty robust audience. It, it does super well in, in Latin markets. Um, you know, so so those are the if, if I was starting off 100 percent do a horror, um, you know, it's friends, favors, you know, <laughs> anything you can, um, you know, make it gory, make it fun, um, uh, and then shoot it somewhere tax efficient. Um, but, and then, you know, the, get a sales agent and, you know, you know, he, I, I think that they're more gettable in that range as well. There, there's a, a broader spectrum of sales agents that, that will take you on rather than, you know, if, if you're playing at a higher budget, it gets pretty specific and, and, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the more blue chip you go, the, the harder it is to get their attention. So, so that's, that would be my recommend for anyone starting off. Um, you know, I, and as I say, it, it falls into two buckets, one which are programmers, which we look at just how we do it at a price. Um, and you're just, you know, I wouldn't, it's not just churning it out again. You, you, you want to make a great product. Everyone working on it wants to make a good product and you put your heart and soul into it. And that's the great thing about films is that most people are there, it's not a nine to five. You, you, most people are not drawn to film because they're nine to five people. They're drawn because they want to be part of an experience, part of a family, part of something fun. It is, especially when you're on your location, it's about a lot of people coming together to, to make something great. And you really get that sense of community. You don't get another jobs. So, so, you know, that's one side of it. The other bucket, um, and I would say this last one fell into it. We had one before we shot in Vancouver, a romantic comedy with Lana Condor, where you're looking at shooting um, a film with investors whose main, so put it this way, it's not their only goal. 
is to make money. It's also to push forward an agenda. And in the case of the romantic comedy, um, we had an all Asian cast. It was very important to the investors who felt that community is underserved, who were Asian themselves. And there, there was a reason behind it other than, you know, make it for, you know, as, as the best price possible in the best jurisdiction possible and keep all the costs as low as you can. Um, there were other things at play. And, and those are, you know, it's our job. It still is to, you know, how do we return investment? That that's our job. But um, you know, sometimes it's not our only job. If that makes sense. Uh, that totally makes sense, Jamie. On on your side, um, you know, I know you have a, a unique advantage to most producers because of your sales background. Um, but when you are developing something. Um, how a couple of questions one is how much do you feel like you need to package it in order for you to start having conversations with um the sales companies um is it is it just one lead actor or actress um do you do you potentially need to have more than one uh, and also i'm curious um and this opens up to another kind of set of questions to everyone which is um when you're in development as a producer i mean I think it's extremely smart to think about what type of project you want to develop even more. Yes. It's genre. Yes. Horror thriller, but also is there an IP that's out there that's sitting there? Is there uh, you know, something that everyone knows what it is, whether obviously the easy answer is a game, but, but it could be a board game it could be something that you're, that, that immediately that project represents something to people. And you're, you're, we're seeing this now in these biopics on that, that people have created some food, some this, some that. And I think that there's a starting point on that where it automatically gets people attention because it's not just an original idea. I, I, I know I'm going off on a tangent on one side, but I, I, I just want to get your opinion because I know how unbelievably hard it is to, think of an idea, develop it, and then get financing. I'm trying to think if there's anything that you do to put yourself in an advantage um, to that process. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think uh, what's funny is some of my first meetings I had with uh, one specific uh, studio that uh, that kind of does get a little more actively involved in the um, in, in the independent marketplace. And it was the gentleman that I'd, I'd mentioned that kind of steered me in the direction of looking at being a producer, is that uh, established IP is uh can be the star of your movie it doesn't have to necessarily be an actor um i mean an, an example i mean it's on my imdb is as you know i'm uh i was involved with the jeepers creepers uh, uh with a, a reboot on that um i'm sorry and uh <laughs> and but i also i'm i'm, I'm uh, i have uh silent night deadly night that we're doing a remake of that uh early next year and I'm really excited about that property. And, uh, and, and our script is incredible. We have an incredible director attached. Uh, the need for names uh, in the, that movie, uh, we, we're not required to have known actors in that movie necessarily because it's an established IP property that even though Silent Night, Deadly Night isn't Friday the 13th or Nightmare on Elm Street, it's a well-known property. And uh, and it also, uh, you know, our director is uh, is is somebody who's really making a name for himself. And I find that a lot in horror, especially is that, you know, on a pre-sale packaging type of basis, you can do a lot with just having a, an established director more so than established cast necessarily on horror. Um, but as far as like when, uh, when the names really start getting a, a, attached, I mean, I think that's what, that's again, that's one of those chicken and an egg thing that I kind of just, I, I walk, I walk the line around it um, until the absolute last, moment and i think the agents kind of act the same way until the absolute last moment that you can assign the person to the project you're not signing the person it's more it's more uh, uh just conversations with the buyers uh or the distributors about what level of actor they're expecting and then uh, you know you establish the fact that the actor's available or that the actor's interested and uh, i've seen a lot of questions about payer play offers as well in the q a um, you know, pay or play offers, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have 100% of that money for that actor sitting into an escrow account that you're dropping into the actor's escrow account. Um, sometimes it can be a negotiation where you're saying we'll put 10% down right now, or something like that in order to attach that name, um, which becomes important as far as closing out the sales agreements. But I mean, you're, you're in this, you know, 20, 30 days before actual filming starts. 
you're in this mad rush of signing all the actor agreements to actually have them firmly attached, which then triggers the distribution agreements to be able to be finalized because they have the names of the actors built into the distribution agreement as a, as an essential element. And, and, and you kind of have this just mass signing of a whole bunch of agreements that really just kind of solidifies exactly what your package is. And none of that really happens until about 30 days before you're shooting or, or maybe 60 days before, depending on how your financing structures, you know, what, what their requirements are. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I, even with me, I mean, my first movie was a sports movie and Terrence Howard was in it and um, it did fairly well. And I'm proud of it, but I, I just closed on a another true story, a sports movie. And my first instinct is to go to a massive sports producer um, because we, we I want this to be a studio film. Um, and, and I and I and I think, you know, even with my background, when all the movies I've done, I haven't done that um, Rudy, that Seabiscuit, whatever, whatever you want to put into there. And I, I, for me, I can't stress that enough for producers, even producers that have done a movie, 10 movies, 20 movies, you know, you're only as good as your track record when you're talking to an agent or a manager about trying to get that actor. And the very first thing that they're going to do is, is this person have any type of pedigree that's going to allow us to focus on this project, regardless of if there's money or not? And I, my, my, so my instinct is always um, not necessarily to go right to talent. It's trying to bring in a, an, an A-list team around us so that when we do make that call of the talent, everyone leans in. I, I'm, I'm just curious on, on your all perspective, if, if you guys follow that model or if you have something unique. Um, I, I'm happy to answer that. I, I think he, uh, we look at each project as, uh, you know, a, a separate entity almost and so sometimes we'll, we'll bring on other producers and we, we we do that often um i you know i think it's always um you know humorous especially uh you know you look in the the tv world and the, the big series and you see like nine names of massive people you know like you've got the sean levy's and and you know and it's just a long list and it's like well one of those guys doesn't need those other people but clearly um there, there's a world where they do um and sometimes you know i think I think it's very hard for people to imagine, like, you, you know, you look on paper and someone's successful. The bottom line is, is like, there is so much competition, both at a studio level, at a sales level, at a distribution level, across the board, that um, even like the giant guys get turned down, you know, whether it's, you know, the Michael Bays or Spielberg, they do. It's like, not every project's for everyone. Um, so I think there is strength in numbers. Um, you know, I think it comes down to you, you can't inflate your budget too much. Um, and, and also certain projects, you know, is it worth doing if, if, if you know, you, you need a certain amount, you know, to be paid? And obviously you're splitting that down. These are all factors you have to go in. But again, it's like if it's it's going to be a year of your life as a producer, it's literally a year of your life. Um, in some cases, as we know, if you don't have great, you know, post people and post suits that it ends up in, you know, legal delivery. I mean, Patrick, you and I talk about it all the, all the time. Like I'm still working on movies from five years ago, like literally like, you know, checking accounts and dealing with this, and dealing with that. Um, so it's like, you know, you better really love something and the people you work with because it is miserable when you don't. I can tell you that. Yeah. Because it isn't like, you know, like you can be a crew. I've come on. Here's my five weeks. I'll see you guys later. It's like, you know, for the rest of us, it's a year of our lives. Everyone on this call, it's a year of our lives plus. So you better really like the people, like the project. And that comes back to dealing with people like Ryan, where you better have people who, you know, can help you. And the earlier you bring them in, the headache said by not having payroll, I'm telling you right now, come land back on you as the producer, you know, eight oh, yeah. months after your wrap. I'm I'm searching through Google Drives for receipts. It's miserable. So, I mean, it's it's yeah. not just logistic and time. It's also like massive amount of money you could lose in tax credits if you're if you're not organized and something potentially doesn't qualify six months later. And all I, I you had to you do was adjust prime it. Prime yeah. example of that: a film that will not be mentioned was shooting just before us on our last movie in the wonderful state of Georgia, who have a wonderful tax credit. And you know, I highly recommend you know shooting down there. Um, 
But you know the you know part of that is just a small piece. Like like Airbnb is there. Airbnb is not a Georgia-based company. So if if you put up your crew in Airbnbs and then you go back and say like, hi, the state of Georgia, I, I you know I'd like on lodging my tax credit. They're going to laugh at you. And there was a very large movie that came before us that did just that. Um, they just didn't know. And you're just like, I could have told you that, but that's experience. These are the things you learn along the way. It's a small thing, but in that case, it was a six hundred and fifty thousand dollar hit. So it suddenly um, it gets real, real bad, real quick. And again, it's like these are the things you need to know if they, you know. But but it's like the you know all along the way, we all of us on this call have done these type of things, and it's only through experience and and repeat and rinse, repeat, and you learn and you just keep. You know, I would say be meticulous in your notes if you can as a producer. Um, be super detail orientated, or at least have a partner or 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 someone who you work with who is because you're going to need it. Ryan, I, I want to segue a little bit into the tax credit side and just get your perspective on, on some of the states. But but Jeremy, if you don't mind, I, I because I know you have worked with some major IP and, and major brands, um, I, I just want to get your perspective on development when you have uh, a, a, an idea for a movie. You know, are you thinking about brand partners um, at, at a development stage or, or is that not something that necessarily crosses your mind? Uh, not at a development stage. No, um, I don't like there is a lot of brand money out there for films, I would feel like, but it's, it's, a, it's a bit tricky and nuanced. Um, and I don't think it's generally going to be your first money in on a film. Um, you know, r remember the, the perspective of people in those roles. Um, their job is not to not even to make money on an investment, um, but to bring eyeballs um, to, you know, whatever their regular business is. And so they're going to measure the opportunity by the size of your budget, the level of p a spend um, all over the world, level of distribution all over the world, um, other brands that could be involved, um, the casting, um, you know, it's it's like what is flattering for their brand. Um, and, and these are very corporate places. So they're going to expect a corporate presentation. You know, having a script is not really, you know, the, hitting the mark for them. It's, it's going to be more you know, of the marketing speed. Eyeballs. Yeah. Uh, um, it's just different, different language. So um, on the movie that we're doing right now, that's basically an animated movie about two sneakers that get lost in New York. Um, we have a ton of brands. I mean, you know, once, once we got um, a level of, of distribution, um, we, you know, ended up partnering with um, Spotify, Doritos, um, BMG, uh, and one, um, there's one really big, uh, did you, did you use a company for that or did you guys just plow through yourselves and make those phone calls and try to create those relationships? I mean, it, there's a little bit of that, but no, we, we partnered with a group called Ben labs. Um, and we just found it way easier. You know, so you're trying to coat, you're trying to coat all of these brands, you know, like I, I could maybe identify a person, um, at some, at a, at a company to, to call, but I'm not even like there's generally, a person or a group of people at some of these big companies whose job is to seek out these opportunities. And I don't have that Rolodex and you kind of want to do it all at once. Yep. A bit of a yep. frenzy bidding frenzy um, going on. Um, but it's, it's really about selecting that moment for us. It was when we had distribution locked, look of picture, mostly locked um, coming in with even a great screenplay. You know, it's, it's uh, not what those particular folks are going to be looking to evaluate. Yep. Um, uh, so Ryan, just get, get kind of segueing into the, the tax credit side, both internationally, but also mainly in the United States as well, or North America, you know, we, we get stuff every day sent to us. And a lot of times, you know, people are, um, either agnostic on where they want to go. Uh, they have an idea where they want to go, or they're picking places that we know, um, may have some snags on the tax credit side or or maybe taking a, a, a long time in order for those tax credits to pay out. If if you don't mind, uh, maybe highlight a couple of what you think are the best states currently um, that have the best, not only tax incentives, um, but also ones that can turn it around rather quickly and not just goes into the ether for potentially years before you're paid back. Yeah, um, that's, you know, it's it's definitely the question that comes up the most uh, when I do talk to, to producers and whatnot is, uh, you know, hey, I'm, I'm agnostic. I can go anywhere. Where should I go? 
or a lot of times people will say, I hear George is the best, so I have to go there. So let's make it work. Um, I don't always agree with that because these tax credits, I say it a lot in all these panels, is they're, they're unique snowflakes, right? So they're all very, very unique. And what was best for one person's production may, may not be best for yours. If you're, you know, have a, a high above the line and that state has an above the line cap and it's lower than others, then that may not be the best place for you. So it is a very uh, interesting and important to navigate these incentives based on your particular needs and your particular script and budget and all that good stuff, as I'm sure everybody on this panel can tell you. Um, I am seeing still a lot of horror movies, so it's it's interesting to hear the group say that, and it's confirming a lot of what I'm seeing as well. Um, you know, those are just so cheap to make, and there's a, a lot of times, and they're just they're easier. It's something that comes across my desk a lot is somebody saying, you know, I, I usually kind of get like almost giddy. They're like, yeah, I'm doing a horror movie. I'm like, how many locations is it? They're like one, it's in a house. I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> like we can put you pretty much anywhere. You know, it's thrown to Mississippi where the minimum criteria is $50,000. So it's like, there's a lot of things out there depending on your particular project. There are still, of course, those cornerstones of the incentives. So of course, we still hear Georgia, Louisiana, New Mexico. The question just turns into, as mentioned, is it right for you? And then to kind of Marcus's point, like pointing out Georgia, because everybody loves to talk about it. Great program, but, you know, there was a bill earlier this year to kill it or cap it, I should say. Didn't go through, thankfully. But as they're going through it, they are starting to tighten the screws more. And so there's a lot of puddles you could jump into if you don't have somebody with experience. So going back to your point, Patrick, about surrounding yourself with a great team and experience, it's so important to be like, hey, have you worked in Georgia before? Did your accountant work in Georgia before so they know what to flag? Um, you know, reaching out to, to someone like myself or your payroll company saying, hey, turn the withholdings on, make sure I get a G7, Make sure, you know, with your accountant, did you get a verification of work form? And they're going to prorate now your producers based on their work outside of Georgia. And there's so much, I don't want to say red tape, but let's just say paperwork to be done now to get that lucrative tax credit that you just want to be prepared for it and have the right team around you. Um, so, so states like Georgia, Louisiana, New Mexico, they still remain popular. Um, New Jersey is getting very, very popular. They changed a lot this year. Um, they opened the door for more reality, which is interesting because before they made that extremely difficult. Um, they're supposed to have a pretty fast turnaround. Um, and I've seen it firsthand that their turnaround is fairly fast. I have heard, though, that they're, when they issue the tax credit, that's a transferable tax credit, they issue it based on your um, cert certificate, which would be a prior year. So sometimes you have to go and do like an amendment on your prior year to take full advantage of New Jersey. So there's always going to be something there to navigate around. Marcus had mentioned Kentucky, another one that's very popular right now, but there's things to be aware of. Your production insurance won't qualify. Your workers' comp won't qualify. Uh, payroll employer fringes do not qualify there. So terrific program, but just be aware of these things. Work, talk to somebody like a Marcus or somebody that's, that's crossed those states and can say, hey, I saw this, that, and the other. You know, it's it's that's extremely, extremely important because if you just go off of hearsay that, you know, Marvel's in Georgia and so I need to go to Georgia, maybe not. Like, in fact, maybe the opposite because if you take your $2 million show to Georgia, odds are proving up is going to be extremely difficult because Marvel's there and your budget didn't have per diem, it didn't have travel because you thought you were going to get everybody there in Georgia. Just all things to be aware of when going to, to these states to talk to somebody with experience. Um, as far as like trends and whatnot, I mentioned Kentucky. Oregon's starting to get popular since they increased their program. Um, we're starting to see more trends with uh, diversity, whether it be requirements, like now California has requirements for that. New York's implementing that or bonuses like New Jersey has. And then the newest thing is what they're calling production partners which is extremely interesting. Whereas if a studio or even doesn't even have to be a studio in New Jersey, if you team up with somebody that has a long-term investment in infrastructure in the state, you're able to capitalize on a lot of different bonuses. Um, so New Jersey has a partnership program. New Mexico has a very popular one, which is why we see Netflix in New Jersey and New Mexico. And then if you just recently were seeing in the, in the trades, 
Warner Brothers just shot out something to Nevada where they're like, hey, if you guys do this, we're going to commit to this. So there's this whole like production partner thing going on with with um, the tax incentive states right now. It's pretty, pretty interesting. But I would say as a whole, the incentives are fairly healthy. Um, most states do have them. And if they don't have them, they try to get them back. Um, but if your turnaround time is important, I would look at rebate and grant states because then you don't have to do a tax return and you don't have to sell it on the open market. So I mentioned in Mississippi, but you got to keep your paperwork tight in that state. And then like North Carolina, where you just need like a director's cut and then they can issue you their your, your grant and your check back pretty quick. So um, if timing is a factor, something to consider is look at the grants and rebates uh, states versus a tax credit state. That's yeah. that's too much. I'm, it's long winded, but that's no. Ryan, Ryan's right on it. I mean, no. that's and 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 it's also you got to be up to date. Like yeah. that's the crazy part, which is you know it's like we we had something that was meant to shoot in the UK, we couldn't make it work, and then obviously the UK government um, brought in the new tax credit, so now it's like at forty percent for fifteen million and under, probably nets out to around thirty two point seven. But after you know fees and everything else and hidden costs, but still that that, that a movie that before at twenty percent didn't go at thirty two point seven now is a go picture, um, and I can shoot it you know where where everyone lives. It makes more sense. So you know we have that going next year. Um, but these are the things and, 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 you know, I know Patrick, Jeremy and, and Ryan, you can talk more about it, but there is a huge difference between a tax credit and a tax rebate. For example, there is a, you know, there's a, uh, you know, we talk about the state of New York. If you're waiting on that audit, that's two and a half years backlog. So would I shoot in New York? No, thanks. Who's waiting two and a half years with a debt lender? Like, uh, no, that's now we're in, we're in usury territory. So yeah. th these are the things that, you know, it's not that there are other things at play other than you looking it up on a website and being like, oh, great, I get 25 percent back. Right. You then have to go and talk to the Patrick's and Jeremy's of the world and work out, well, hey, on that, what, what does that actually mean as a net to me for when I need the money? And that is crucial. I mean, Patrick, Jeremy, you want to talk a little bit about, about more what you guys do? Because, I mean, this is when you get in the weeds and it's the nuance. That's the difference between, you know, making and losing money, having a green light picture and a picture that doesn't go. Yeah, I mean, our our main, um, I think, unique style is that we have so many different lenders that we work with that when we go out with a project, we see... I think a better perspective of the marketplace than anyone else, anyone else out there, because we know um, what 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 distributors uh, lenders are lending against or not. We know what international sales companies are lending against or not, and certainly which countries states um, that they're lending against. And a lot of times, um, uh, projects come to us, uh, and I'm looking. I'm, I'm I'm now starting to look at the the questions, so we can you know go to Q and A a bit. Um, the last 15 minutes as well, even though I've been I've been looking at this for the last half hour, um, is is uh it's very important. You know, like th there, there's a project that just came to us from South Africa, uh, has an unbelievable tax credit uh, there. Um, however, uh, we went out wide to our lender base, and and nobody was comfortable lending against it because there had been some films, I guess, over the recent couple of years that there were some issues on the tax credit side. So, um, you know, I, I, going piggybacking on what everyone's saying, including Ryan, is, you know, sometimes the incentive could look really good, but there could be something else going on that 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 you don't necessarily know about. And I think the lenders themselves will have a good pulse on that because if something goes sideways in any particular state or country one time, that spreads like wildflower to all of the lenders. And it is a fairly limited, you know, base of uh, financiers that are out there. Um, I, Ryan, I just want to, there's somebody had just uh, asked a question about um, Illinois and specifically Chicago. Um, they're looking to shoot a movie there. I'm just curious if you have any insight on either um, on, 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 you know, your thoughts on it. Yeah. I mean, Chicago is especially has always been very popular for filming. I mean, you, you turn on the TV and you see a Chicago PD and a Chicago, this and Chicago, that it's always been very hot for TV um, and very popular. It is an uncapped program and it's transferable. So you do have to sell it on the open market, which is something as Marcus mentioned, you have to take in consideration because the 30% may not be a true 30. 
uh, given that you have to sell it for a discount in order to make your to make your cash. What's interesting about Illinois and what's really great actually is before they used to never incentivize non-residents. It was always a big thing. Illinois has been around very, very long, easily over a decade, and they've never incentivized non-residents. Now they are, um, which is really, really interesting. There are some stipulations to it, you know, with regards to above the line. It's like, oh, there's only certain nine positions. They narrowed it down to nine that qualify. Hey, Ryan, can you take a step back and, and just uh, mention what does that mean, non-residents? Sure. I, I know what it means, but Sorry. just in case anyone is not entirely sure what that what you're referring to. Of course, of course. So a lot of these states, especially like Illinois, will, will specify that residents, meaning people that live in Illinois, qualify, and people that don't live in Illinois but are working there do not qualify. So a lot of states will dictate residents versus non-residents. Now, the work can still be done in the state, but it doesn't matter if a state like Utah or Texas says that, hey, non-residents do not qualify, well, then it doesn't even matter if they're working in the state. They are a non-resident. Um, but if you're a resident, which, you know, well, to that point, these popular states I talked about, Georgia, Louisiana, um, you know, they always incentivized residents and non-residents, which is why they're so popular. Illinois never did do any non-residents. And now the fact that they can allow, I think it's depending on your budget, it can go up to four uh, actors, SAG actors, um, if they're non-residents, and then there's nine positions, it's usually key department heads that can qualify in Illinois. It's been kind of a game changer. Everybody that's filming in Illinois is able to capitalize on that before, when in the past that 30% was just a wash. So they had a very interesting change a year and a half ago, and it's been very, very prosperous. But great program, low minimum spend, uncapped, transferable, and now you're uh, above the line. Uh, non-residents can qualify uh that's very helpful uh there, there's another question just just uh generally on lender rates um in the specific time for return on investment for lenders um and i i can just jump in and, and just give you just some general numbers from what we're seeing um generally speaking um we see rates that go is as good as uh 10 percent and as and as high as 30 percent um, and, and when I say that huge range, it's, it's the difference between what are they lending against? Are they lending against tax credit or pre-sale? And what's the length of time versus lending against a estimate from a sales company, which there's considerably more risk involved. Um, you know, I, I think the average length of a loan is typically six months to a year. Um, there are certain loans that can be out for two plus years, depending on the state. I don't know, know New York is a little bit, um, uh, there is a delay in New York on the tax credit that could potentially push out a loan over the two to three year mark. Um, uh, and um, I know that, that's a, you know, it's a very important model for everyone on this panel because everyone knows that to some degree, you know, you're lending against these tax credits and these pre-sales. So, you know, they're trying to get as low of a, of a, of a loan amount as possible. Um, uh, I'm just trying to look through some of these other questions when we have a couple minutes left. Um, does anybody want to tackle just the difference between um, gap financing versus bridge financing? Um, want to throw it out there to anybody who wants to answer that. I'm happy to jump in on that. Sure. Um, <laughs> I mean, a, a gap financing is typically once your finance plan is closed uh, and you have unsold territories, um, that you've now banked against your pre-sales, your tax credits, and whatever else, whatever that um, remaining portion that you that you were unable to uh, uh, to to basically pre-sell. Uh, if, if you have a reputable sales agent, there there are banks that'll bank against unsold territories as gap, or or unsold uh, you know or or just any additional revenues that might come in, they might gap against it. There's not a lot of gap lenders, and typically what it's going to be is a lot of times these gap loans are going to be, um, you know, they might be structured into your existing uh, uh, loan against your pre-sales. Um, it might they might gap you a certain amount, um, you know, to to get you across the finish line. Uh, whereas a bridge uh, bridge lending is typically uh, a short term uh, a short term solution to be able to get your cash flow in sooner. Uh, let's say your your bank loan uh, against your pre-sales and tax credits and so on and so forth is going to uh, pay out in six weeks, but you start production in three weeks. 
you'll take a bridge loan against uh, against whatever portion you need to keep you going until that six weeks period closes, and then you'll pay back your bridge lender from your senior loan. Thank you. Very helpful. Well <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Renata is asking um, if anyone has the uh, experience on uh, and the appeal for co-productions internationally, whether it's U.S. and EU or U.S. and U.K. Um, I throw that out to the panel. If there's any any insight that you want to share on the potential benefits of having a international co-production with the U.S. or, for that matter, two international co-productions with different countries, I'm not aware if there are any U.S. co-production treaties. Really, I mean, you hear about it all the time with uh, European countries having co-production treaties or. Uh, you know, I, I know that there was a co-production treaty. Uh, China had them with several countries. But um, as far as the U.S. is concerned, I'm not aware that the U.S. has any co-production treaties. It's I think it's more specific to a lot of international countries. Yeah. And, and I think it just all ties into maximizing the tax credit. So however you do it, you know, if you're trying to squeeze in every every line item in that budget, how do you get to qualify um, and, and there there are ways to do that, whether it's teaming up with a, a UK or Irish um, production entity in Canada. Um, there is these European co-pros that really help maximize the incentive. Um, I know we're, we're wrapping up. I, I just have a question for you guys on on unions today. Um, you know that we, we all deal with them on the independent model, um, whether it's SAG, um, IATSE, uh, DGA, Teamsters. Um, I'd love to you guys to talk about the, um, you know, just the process of working with unions on U.S. productions. Um, how do you typically do it? Um, is is there a right or wrong way to um, approach that? Um, and, and and also the difference of working on a film outside the U.S., whether it's Canada or the U.K., and the difference on that process versus something in the U.S. Anybody want to jump on that one? Yeah, well, I can I can kind of start just by saying you're muted, Marcus. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there is a right way of doing it. There's and there's certainly a wrong way of doing it, and it's it's really yeah. just two gloves. Um, you know, like your relationship with those guilds is you know is really your ability to make movies, um, and you know the the power that they wield in making you sort of over raise your financing based on these deposits that they're going to hold, uh, you know, endlessly. Um, it's, you just, you know, it is just paramount that you maintain good relations with them. Um, it will save you headache and it will save you money as well. Um, and I, and I, I have done, uh, the, we, we, we did a animated film actually that, um, we did entirely of the voice cast, um, in the UK, um, and it did, we, we were able to avoid all the guilds, um, and, uh, it was definitely successful that way, but it was also pretty restrictive that we, we had to re record British talent on British soil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just, I would just echo, I think what we all know, which is like, it's, um, you, you have a part of working here in the U S is you, you have to deal with the unions. I, it's a, I, you know, it's, it's a, a love hate relationship. I think for most producers, I think, I think partly because we're salty that we don't have, you know, a decent union of our own, <laughs> so, you know, no one protects <laughs> us really. It's, it's kind of insane. Um, but, you know, as, as Jeremy said, it, it's, you, you know, you, you have to deal with them and, and it's ultimately, it's about dialogue. Um, you know, it's like any business you, you have to talk, you have to deal. Um, and, and, you know, the, the better relation, the, the easier it will be, but, you know, do, do I think that, um, it's in some cases too restrictive and it's why, you know, in the last, our last five movies, I've shot one here, one in Serbia, two in Canada, um, and the next two, one's in Dominican and one's in the UK. And there is a reason for that, because if it was apples to apples, I would shoot here because, you know, I live here. We, we love being here. And, you know, we, we have, you know, as I'm sure all of us on the call can say, the, these are all our friends. We want to employ our friends who we trust and do a great job. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it becomes more and more difficult. Um, I believe, and and I just think the the finance model a lot of the times doesn't make sense if we choose to shoot or try and shoot in the U.S., which sucks to be honest. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I think uh, I think we're Robin. We're we're wrapping up here. We got you know fantastic okay. uh, you know panel guys. I, I could keep going and pepper you guys for another hour and a half, but um, thank you everyone for taking the time here. Uh, extremely insightful, and um, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. Um, you know, I appreciate um, everybody's expertise and knowledge on this on this really important topic. Just on a final note. Uh, we hope that many of you will attend this year's AFM November 5 through 10 in Las Vegas, either as an exhibitor, buyer, or a general attendee. Um, and as conversations like this are very much a part of the conference series that we put on at AFM from treatment to screen and everything in between. So um, for more information about attending, go to AmericanFilmMarket.com. Uh, thank you again for listening, and we hope to see you on our next finance webinar. Thank you. <laughs>